And so we have the prophetic word confirmed, which you do well to heed as a light that shines in a dark place until the day dawns and the morning star rises in your hearts. Knowing this first, that no prophecy of scripture is of any private interpretation, for prophecy never came by the will of man, but holy men of God spoke as they were moved by the Holy Spirit. Thank you, and may the Lord add his blessing to the reading of his word. Isn't it a wonderful time to be a Bible-believing Christian? Amen. Not because it's getting easier, but because it's getting harder. That means the harvest is ripe and plenty. I'm going to talk about a uh, subject that just won't seem to go away today. How do we know we have the right 66 books in the Bible? It's a little bit different question, how do we know the Bible's reliable and truth? But how do we know we have the right books? Who chose them? How was it chosen? So I'm going to give you just a brief, because this is a, a whole semester course on this. And you will know it in one hour or less. That's how Marines speak. We know, no, not a should or maybe. You will know this. So I'm going to cover some of the highlights here. I'm going to do a seven-part defense here, part defense here on how we know we have the right book of the Bible. And the first part starts this way, the necessity of a creator. I want to just lay the foundation. Do you know without a creator God, nothing could exist? Therefore, God must exist. And know the answers we get. Oh, wait a minute, Mike, you forgot about something. The universe created itself. Has anybody ever seen nothing create something? No, you always have to start with Legos or something. Nothing cannot create something. Oh, but Mike, maybe it always existed. Well, if it always existed, there's a simple law of science, well, it's a pretty complicated law, really, called the second law of, I'm going to use one of these big words, thermodynamics. Thermo means heat, dynamics, we're talking about heat energy. Everything's losing its available heat energy over time for doing work. Well, why aren't we wearing down? Well, you are, just look at the person next to you again. But we can replenish that by eating and breathing. But eventually, it takes a toll on us. So if, if the universe has always existed, we'd be in what's called a virtual heat death. All the energy in the universe would have been used up by now. So they don't really have an answer. Oh, wait, wait, wait. I was in an upper level physics classroom one time. And the professor spoke up and said, well, Mike, this is going to be one of those big words. It was a quantum fluctuation. Everybody talks about those around the dinner table, don't you? It was a quantum fluctuation. Here was my response. A quantum fluctuation. Fluctuation requires energy. Where did your energy come from? You know what he did next? He said this in front of the class. I guess we have to accept by faith also. My whole speech changed then because the argument was over. Next thing I did was go for the juggler. I gave him the gospel right in an upper level physics classroom. That's what you want to do. That's what they needed to hear. They didn't need to hear any more science. They already knew they had faith. So just give them the gospel. Now, this creator, without a creator God, nothing can exist. Therefore, God must exist. And there's also only one God out there. And he's the creator of all things. You know, that's just not a Genesis account. It occurs in the Old Testament and New Testament. These are just some of the verses that teach God created all things. So it's a consistent message throughout the Bible. God is the creator of all things, and he has to exist. So that's part one. Now let's go to part two. How, who is our God? What are some of his characteristics? Well, there is no unrighteousness in him. He is faithful. He is all-knowing. He knows the end from the beginning. You know, no other religion talks about a God like that. Only the true God can know the end from the beginning. He has to be above time, because if he's not, then he's not the almighty God. There's something bigger than him. So he has to know the end from the beginning. He's all-powerful. He spoke everything into existence. I hear these college professors say, oh, Mike, the Bible doesn't tell us how God created. You know what my response is? Read the Bible. Over and over again it talks about he spoke it into existence by his great power. And then he cannot lie. 
Those are just some of the characteristics of our God, the creator of all things. Then the Bible comes from God. We read this. In the Bible, God spoke precisely, exactly, and directly to the matters that concern Him and us. In other words, He told us all about Himself. He gave it to us in words that we can understand, such as Psalm 119. The unfolding of your words gives light. It gives understanding to the simple. Whoa. That's what that means if you don't understand it. You're below simple. It doesn't mean it's all easily understandable. We need the gift of the Holy Spirit sometimes to understand some of these parts. And great men have gone before us and written some good commentaries. 2 Timothy 3, 16 and 70 tells us all Scripture is what? God breathed. It all came from our Creator who created everything out of nothing. Then we have 2 Peter 1, 20 through 21, which says this. But know this first of all, that no prophecy of Scripture is a matter of one's own interpretation. For no prophecy was ever made by an act of human will, but men moved by the Holy Spirit spoke from God. What does that tell us? All Scripture is what? God breathed. Then tells us God's Word will last forever. Matthew 5.18 teaches this, For truly I say to you, until heaven and earth pass away, not the smallest letter or stroke shall pass from the law until all is accomplished. Then in Mark 13, 31 we read, Heaven and earth will pass away, but my words will not pass away. So God, the creator of all things, gave us his word, and he said, It will never pass away. 1 Peter 1 25. But the word of the Lord endures forever. Isaiah 40, verse 8. The grass withers, the flowers fade. But the Word of our God stands forever. We're seeing a theme there. And it's all God breathed. It all came from Him. Timothy Paul Jones, he's got a doctorate in education, and he's also got one of those PhDs in something called philosophy. And an MDiv makes this statement. The Holy Bible has withstood thousands of attempts to destroy its truth and to discredit its authority. And yet, no one has succeeded. The truth and the authority of the Scriptures stand strong, regardless of every attempt to render them ineffective. So, can the Bible be trusted in a word? Yes. Over and over again, people have tried to destroy God's Word, they've tried to ban it, and they've tried to outlaw it. But God's Word remains here with us today. So, let's go to part three. Ooh, some fancy words. Canon, canonicity, and inspiration. How we got the 66 books is what we're going to go into. Let's look at some words. Canon, a rule or standard by which something is judged. Okay, so we're going to be talking about that, the canon scripture. The biblical canon refers to the books Christians accept as authoritative. That's both Old Testament and New Testament. And canonization, that's the process the church used to recognize which books were authoritative and belonged to the Bible. So, we're going to focus on the canon and canonization. The word canon comes from the root word reed. The reed was used as a measuring rod or a standard. That's where we get this word from. Therefore, canon refers to the standard or rule. When referring to the Bible, it refers to a list of books which are regarded as having divine authority. So, when we say the canon of Scripture, we're talking about the divine authority of God's Word. Canonicity, how did we do this? Three standards were used. One, a test of authorship. We're going to go through each one of these. Who authored the books? Two, orthodoxy. Do all the scriptures agree? Are there any contradictions in there? And third one was acceptance. How widely accepted were each of these books and writings? Those are the three main rules or standards they use for choosing the 66 books in the Bible. So, let's talk about test one, authorship and inspiration. Again, all Scripture is inspired by God and beneficial for teaching. Stop right there. All of it is good for teaching. So, why do so many churches not teach the creation or the book of Revelation? 
Those churches are being disobedient to God's Word. They need to teach all about our Creator God in Genesis, and they need to teach about His last book, the book of Revelation. For teaching, for rebuke, for correction, for training in righteousness, so that the man or woman of God may be fully capable, equipped for every good work. You know, when it says all Scripture, that even includes the book of Numbers. Inspiration. The Holy Spirit moved men to write. He allowed them to use their own styles, cultures, gifts, and character. That's why we see different styles in the Bible. He used men and their talents. He allowed them to use the results of their own study and research, write of their own experiences, express what was on their minds. That's like Luke. He did a whole research. That's what he did. He did research to write the book. The Holy Spirit did not allow error to influence their writings. He's God. The Holy Spirit is God. Therefore, they recorded accurately all God wanted them to say. Let's talk about God and canonicity. The canon of Scripture was inspired and preserved by God, not the church. That's important to understand. The church, and this is another keyword, recognized it under the sovereign direction of God. In other words, the church didn't just go out and say, these are the books we want. They recognized it by what? Those three rules that we talked about. Who is the author? Since the Bible is God's Word, we must listen to its claims about itself. Our Creator God said, this is my Word, it's inspired through me, therefore it is true and you need to read it. We cannot have a reliable Savior without a reliable Scripture, folks. If we can't trust the Bible, how do we know we can trust Jesus Christ as Lord and Savior? And doubting the canon of Scripture is essentially doubting God's sovereign ability to preserve His Word through inspired men. We have a God who can raise the dead, heal people instantly, cast out demons, he can preserve His Word. This means there are no errors in science, history, or moral areas of the Bible. Any scientific statement or reference to science, such as the creation account that the Bible makes, must be true. Folks, this is where we have a lot of problem in our church. They just cannot accept that God created in six days because they believe the scientists have proven otherwise. Folks, you know no scientist on this planet can prove the earth is four and a half billion years old? You have been snookered if you believe that. That's the technical term. John 17, 17, sanctify them in the truth. Your word is truth. There we go again. His word is true. Do you really trust it? Don't let Satan plant doubts in your mind. We can trust God's word. So part four, let's talk about the Old Testament now. Canonicity and the Old Testament. The church of Jesus Christ is built upon the foundation of the apostles and prophets. Ephesians 2.20 states, Having been built on the foundation of the apostles and prophets, Christ Jesus Himself being the cornerstone. So we're putting a lot of reliability here on the authors of the prophets and the apostles. The apostles being what? Eyewitnesses to everything. Let's take a look at this. Jesus affirmed the historical reliability of the Scriptures by speaking of Adam and Eve, the first humans. Jesus believed Adam and Eve were real. Who is Jesus Christ? Folks, He is the creator of all things. He's the one who called everything into existence. He's the eyewitness. He's our creator, He's our savior, and He will be our judge. Adam and Eve, He talked about as real people. Abel, as a real person. The reality of Noah and the global flood. He believed there was a worldwide flood. Abraham was a real person who rejoiced in the Lord. He talked about that. Talked about Moses and the burning bush as real events. Talked about David, Elijah, Daniel, and Jonah. In other words, Jesus affirmed all these people were real people and the events really did happen. So the question is, do you believe Jesus? If you don't, we have a real problem here. We'll see me after the service and we'll talk about the gospel. Actually, we're going to talk about it before then. God and canonicity. The phrase God said occurs over 600 times in the Old Testament. 
Over 2,000 times in the Old Testament there are phrases such as, and God spoke to Moses, or the word of the Lord came to Jonah, or God said 2,000 times. What is God telling us? This is His word, and we need to trust it. In Jeremiah 1.9 it says, Then the Lord stretched out His hand and touched my mouth. And the Lord said to me, Behold, I have put my words in your mouth. Let's talk about the New Testament in Canada City. In the case of the Apostles, the church recognized they carried the authority of Christ. They were eyewitnesses to Jesus Christ. So the early church recognized that the Apostles had that authority. The Gospels of Matthew and Mark, 1 Peter, 1 John, and Paul's 13 epistles were seen as authoritative by the early church. Luke, who was associated with Paul, so we have the book of Luke and the book of Acts also. The apostles had the authority. Jesus gave them that authority. Therefore, it is trustworthy. A second test that was used in teaching must be cons- is the teachings must be consistent with the teachings of the books already accepted as authoritative. That's a big one because a lot of people have tried to add other books. We're going to go through a few of those. They have to agree with what we already see as authoritative, and those include the Gospels and the Epistles, many of them. A third test of a book was based on its usage in the church as a whole. Not individuals, not group meetings, not politics, but as a whole. The widespread usage of these writings means that decisions of candidacy were not made by a few individuals nor a political power. It had to be widespread throughout the church. They had to see it as authoritative also. And the church as a whole recognized a book's divine origin or rejected. In other words, a key again is we recognize these. We, the church didn't just say this book or that book. They actually recognized them by going through these three rules or standards. In 2 Peter 3, 15, 16, Peter testifies that the writings of Paul, the epistles, are God's Word. So, who is Peter? He's one of the apostles. He has the authority, and he recognized Paul's writings as authoritative. In 1 Timothy 5, 18, Paul quotes the words of Jesus found in Luke and calls them Scripture. You know something about Luke? He was the only non-Jewish person to write a book in the Bible. Only Gentile wrote, he's the only Gentile to write part of it. But Timothy says his words are true. In John 14, 26, Jesus promised that the Holy Spirit would guide the disciples in recording all that he had said, truth without error. So it always goes back to that foundation, doesn't it? God exists. And his word is true. Those two parts right there are the basic foundation of Christianity, our presupposition. God exists, and his word is true. By 100 AD, the four Gospels, the writings of Paul, the book of Acts, and some of the epistles were already considered scripture. By AD 100, about 85% of the New Testament was already accepted as authoritative and part of the canon. Muratorian fragment. Ooh, wow, none of those big words also referred to as the Muratorian Canon. It was written within one generation of the actual events. It was written in 170 A.D. Here's what they had in that fragment. Books, all the books we have today except four were included. James was not included because he refers to himself as a bondservant of God, not as an apostle. The book of Jude was not included because, again, referred to himself as a bondservant of Jesus Christ. Revelation, John referred to himself as a bondservant. So, some further work had to be done on these books. They weren't included because they didn't say, I apostle. And 2nd and 3rd John, not clearly referred to as an apostle. That was the stumbling block right there. Should they include it or not include it? Now, here's a, a chart. Now, if you have a perfect memory, you'll remember this. The New Testament was written between 45 and 95 A.D. John, the last apostle, dies uh, in 101 A.D. The Muratorian fragment was listed all but four books in 170 A.D. Arrhenius cites all four books in his works, except four of the books there, and that was written in 
AD 180. So 170 and 180 AD, they had all but four books recognized as authoritative. The Council of Carthage affirmed all 27 books of the New Testament in AD 397. That's when we have the full New Testament in AD 397. Okay. Part six is going to be other books. So we have the Old Testament, very briefly went through that, and then we have the New Testament. What about other books? How about the, uh, something called the Apocrypha? Then let's take a case study. The Gospel of Thomas, one called one of the Gnostic Gospels, mean not real. It fails the test of authorship. There's a lot of Gnostic Gospels out there, meaning uh, basically pretend Gospels. Why, is it, why wasn't it included? Well, it is dated in AD 175 or 1 through 80. That means Thomas could not have written it. He was dead. So Thomas was not the author of that one. Even though they gave Thomas the credit for writing it, it was not written during his lifetime. So, Tom, so there it's a fraud right there, isn't it? It fails the test of orthodoxy. It had an unbiblical view of women. It actually stated, females don't observe, deserve life. That's kind of a problem there, isn't it? That means there should be no human beings left today. <laughs> Can't propagate ourselves. And then it fails the test of acceptance. It was not discovered until 1945. So it fails all three tests or standards by which we choose to have a book in the canon. Other books? The Apocrypha, written between the 3rd century B.C. and the 1st century A.D., consists of 15 books. They were found among the Dead Sea Scrolls. The word Apocrypha means hidden and was originally used to provide secret knowledge. Anybody know who put the Apocrypha in there? That's part of the Catholic Bible today. At the Council of Hippo, 393 A.D., bishops met to approve a biblical canon that closely resembles the Catholic Bible today. So the Catholics used that council, that event, to prove that Apocrypha should be a part of the Bible. Let's go on further. The Roman Catholic Church believes that it is the final authority in all matters of canonicity. Get this. It's not what we recognize. The Catholic Church has set themselves up as the authority, not God, but the Catholic Church as the authority on determining what the Bible should be and should not be. In response to the Reformation, the Roman Catholic Church officially made the Apocrypha 15 books part of the Bible at the Council of Trent, 1546, and pronounced an apocrypha on anyone who does not include them in the canon. In other words, they pronounced a curse on anyone who does not put them in the Bible. That's pretty strong, isn't it? Guess what? You don't have one of those Bibles, do you? Guess what they just said about you? That's the findings of the Catholic Church. Okay, why the Apocrypha is rejected? Judaism never accepted it as part of the Old Testament canon. It was not accepted by any of the Jewish people. The Apocrypha was not universally accepted, rule of acceptance. It fails there. The Apocrypha books were written after the cessation of the voice of God's Spirit in the 4th century B.C., rule of authorship. So none of the apostles had anything to do with it. And no Apocrypha book claims to be inspired. And the early church and the reformers never made the Apocrypha part of the canon because it contained historical and geographical errors, proving it was not divinely inspired. In other words, they had prayers for the dead. The existence of purgatory was in there. And the giving of alms to make atonement for sin. In other words, you can have your own sins forgiven by giving money to the church. That's one of the big, those three are big reasons the Apocrypha is not included in our Bible. It has big problems with orthodoxy. And the New Testament quotes from the Old Testament hundreds of times, but nowhere does it directly quote from anywhere in the Apocrypha. The Gnostic Gospels. The Gnostic Gospels and related writings are part of the New Testament pseudepigrapha, which means false writing. They were written between 200 A.D. and 300 A.D. 
well after the Gospels. They were written by unknown authors who attempted to gain readership by tacking the name of famous biblical characters onto them. In other words, they gave the authorship to many of the apostles, but this, they were written in 200 A.D. to 300 A.D. So they're all false testimonies. That's why they're not included in the canon. They were written under false names. That's called forgery for you lawyer types. Example, let me go back. The Gospel of Peter and the Acts of John were not written by the apostles, but by men in the second century pretending to use apostolic authority to advance their own teaching. So they're frauds. They contain historical errors. They contain heresy. In the book of Acts of John, Jesus is presented as a spirit who left no footprints when he walked, who could not be touched, and who did not really die on the cross. That's part of the Gnostic Gospels. Paul had to deal with this issue himself, didn't he? In 2 Thessalonians 2.2 2, it says, that you not be quickly shaken from your composure, or be disturbed either by a spirit or a message or a letter as if from us, to the effect that the day of the Lord has come. In other words, people were forging Paul's letters at that time, and it still goes on today. Well, we're at the summary and conclusion. I've seen people go on for days with conclusions, just so I'd let you know. <laughs> summary and conclusion. Fact, there's a creator God who gave us His Word. Without a creator God, nothing could exist. It's all God-breathed, 2 Timothy 3.16. Not by the will of men, but holy men of God who were moved by the Holy Spirit, 2 Peter 1.21. The Old Testament was fully accepted by the time of Jesus and accepted by Him, Paul, and the early church. Jesus Himself made testimony about much of the Old Testament as true. The historical evidence is overwhelming that the Gospels, Acts, Paul's 13 letters were viewed as authoritative. That's our core right there. The early church was careful to distinguish between canonical and non-canonical writings. Because a lot of these books were included in the church, but not as part of the canon. So be careful about that. They're, they had some good words in them. They were used in readings, but they were never considered as part of the canon, because they failed the test. The New Testament core books provided an authoritative standard in none of the other books except it contained any competing theology. In other words, the Bible as a whole is theologically accurate all the way through and does not contradict itself. They all met the three standards of canonicity, authorship, orthodoxy, and acceptance. Every book in the Bible had to go through that test. No one church or denomination came out and said, this is what it should be. So how can we be sure we have the right books of the Bible? This is the biggest one of them all, folks. Because the Bible, beginning to end, gives a simple, clear, and consistent salvation message. This is by far the most important. This is the one I want to go through with you now. The most important part that we can trust God's Word, and it is reliable from beginning to end. The context of the Gospel. Do we really believe and understand the full context of the Gospel? I'm going to go through with you right now. If we teach a believer and somebody new the Gospel, not witnessing now, witnessing you might use two or three verses, but if you're going to teach the Gospel to our youth and other people, we need to make sure they understand the whole Gospel. Because where does it start? In Genesis 1.1. In the beginning God created the heaven and the earth. Look at those first four words. In the beginning God. What does that tell us? The Bible never attempts to prove God's existence. It assumes He already exists as we should. In the being God created the heaven and the earth, what does that tell us? He's the creator of all things. He's the sovereign ruler of everything. He owns everything. And since He's the creator, He sets the rules for how we are to live. That first verse is awful important, folks. It tells us an awful lot about who our God is and why He can set the rules and not us. And it also tells us he had a perfect beginning. Everything was perfect in its creation. Genesis 1.31, he pronounced it very good, very meaning, exceedingly. His creation was perfect. No death, no sin. Then our God gives one warning. 
The reason I'm going through this, folks, because a lot of people do not understand Christian needs today. When you go out and tell them, have you ever sinned? They don't understand what the word sin means anymore. We need to make sure they understand what sin is. God gives Adam and Eve one warning. Don't eat of the fruit of this tree. Now, if you give a two-year-old said you can do anything you want except this one thing, what will they do? The one thing. How about you? <laughs> Probably the one thing. So let's not get too hard on Adam and Eve there. Don't do this one thing. And he said, if you disobey me, there will be a punishment. And that punishment will be death. I'd like to give you the bad news. But Mike, this is Sunday morning. Yes, we need to understand the bad news so we can fully appreciate the good news. We're going to go through both this morning. Why? What is sin? Well, the bad news is this, that Adam and Eve rebelled, didn't they? They disobeyed God. They did the one thing they were told not to do. That is what's called sin, disobeying God. So now we have a definition, disobeying God. And we have a God who keeps his promises. Because what happened to Adam and Eve? They died. Oh, wait a minute, Mike. Wait a minute. I didn't see them die then. Anybody reading? They, they died right then and there? No, because that's not what the Bible teaches. The, the literal translation is dying, you will die. The death process, physical death process will start then. The spiritual death process was immediate separation from God. So, the Bible does not contradict itself. We have to be very careful sometimes. Dying you will die is the translation. Now, this is where it starts getting exciting. You know the New Testament says exactly what the Old Testament says? The wages of sin is what? Death. One sin is death. And then our Bible teaches that God demands perfection. You've got to be perfect. Now, what gives God the right to tell us we have to be perfect? He's the creator. He owns everything. He sets the rules. And his rule is, you've got to be perfect. Is anyone here perfect? As soon as you put your hand up, you're a liar. You know the closest thing to perfection? Grandchildren. <laughs> so, the Bible, the New Testament also agrees with that. No one's perfect. For all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. Everyone. Not just if you're in this category over here. Not if you're in this category. Everyone has sinned. And you know what sin does? It separates us from a perfect and holy God. At this point in the gospel, we have no hope. Notice I said that. At this point in the gospel teaching, we have no hope. And I'm going to say this because I like to say this. At this point in the gospel, we are all going to hell. Ooh. Now, remember, we've got the good news to go to. This is why we need to be saved, because we don't want to spend eternity. We don't want other people to spend eternity in there. They have to understand why they want to be saved, because if you're not, this is the default, folks. And this is what Jesus had to say about it. You know, Jesus talked more about hell than anybody else. He talked more about hell than he did heaven. He talked more about hell than all the New Testament authors combined. So it is an important subject, but we're not going to spend a lot of time there this morning. I just want to show you what it is. Tormented in this flame, everlasting fire, punished with everlasting destruction, no rest day or night, lake of fire and brimstone, tormented day and night forever and ever, and outer darkness and weeping and gnashing of teeth. This is what hell is. We don't want anybody to go there. Not our worst enemies do we want to go there, folks. That's why we need to go out there and be witnesses especially to our families. We need to be witnesses to them. So, let's get to the good news now. The good news is outstanding. You know where it starts? In Genesis 3.15. That's where the good news starts. Is Genesis important? Absolutely. We have right there in Genesis 3.15 the first promise of a Savior and victory. And that promise is fulfilled in John 3, 16. For God sent His only begotten Son, whoever believed Him should not perish, but have everlasting life. Now, John 3, 16 is not the gospel, it's missing some key components. But it's where it was fulfilled. God sent His only begotten Son. See, the core of the gospel, if you want to give a mini gospel, is 1 Corinthians 15, 3 and 4, and it reads this way. For I delivered unto you, first of all, that which I also received, how Christ died for our sins 
according to the scriptures. What scriptures? New Testament wasn't written yet. And that he was buried, and that he rose again the third day according to the scriptures. There's your mini gospel. Christ died for our sins, he was buried, and was raised from the dead. Now, let's continue on here. You know, over and over again, the Bible, Jesus says what? Repent. Over and over again. Repent and be saved. Not that it's our works. God gives us the ability to do that. He says, you need to be sorry about your sins. Deeply sorrow. Now, this is where it gets really exciting. This is the message that the cults don't have, folks. It's a free gift. All those sins, the thousands of sins we commit in our lifetime, God says, I'm giving you a free gift. It's called salvation. And then these two verses, Ephesians 8 and 9, are what separate Christianity from every other religion in the book. For by grace you are saved through faith, not by your works. Every other religion in the world requires you to do something for your salvation. The Bible says, our God says, no, it's a free gift, and it's through my grace and the faith I give you. It's called do and done. Every other religion requires you to do something for your salvation. God's Word says, no, it's already been done. When my son came up out of that grave, it was finished. And then he says this, God's grace. I've had military people come to me and say, Mike, God can't save me for what I've done. And they tell me what they've done. They've been on the battlefield. They've killed other people. And they've been told that uh, they can't be saved. First thing I think about the people that make that statement is they don't know who our God is. They've gotten their information, our God, from the media, not God's Word. Our God says His grace and His mercy is big enough to cover anything you have ever done. Stop playing God and accept Jesus Christ God. His grace and mercy can cover everything. Then he says this, do you know he didn't wait for you to come to him? One of the God talks about this. He didn't wait for you to come to him. He came to you while you were still dead in your sins. That's who our God is. We have some wonderful news to tell people. And he also says this, there's only one way. It's not through Buddha, Joseph Smith, Allah, or anybody else. It is only through Jesus Christ. There's no other name in all heaven by which we can be saved. It is only through Jesus Christ, and it's free. And he also says this, you don't have an excuse. Romans 1 tells us this, that everybody on this planet who has ever lived or will live in their heart of hearts knows God exists. There are no excuses. Romans 2 says he's put his moral law in all of our hearts. There's no such thing as an innocent native anywhere. I've been asked this question and challenged with this. What about all those people who have never heard about Jesus? They have no excuse. They know God exists. God has put that in them. There's no excuses, folks. So, it comes down to this. How is it done? How do we do this? Romans 10, 9. That if you confess with your mouth that Jesus Christ is Lord, and you believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, you will be saved. What does that mean? You're making a promise. You're confessing Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior. That means you're giving your heart, soul, and mind over to Jesus Christ. Then you believe that he was raised from the dead. You will be saved. What a message we have to give. What a great message we have to give. And it's free. So I tell people, when you're witnessing to the cults, Mormonism is the number one religion in the area we live in, Boise, Idaho. And I'll tell people, you don't have to be a great student of Mormonism to witness to them. Just know three or four things. But what they need to hear is this, that it is a free gift. I ask two questions. One, do you believe the Bible? A lot of times I get to an extent. Then I ask them the second most important question that could change their lives. Would you tell me how you get to heaven, how you get saved? Then I'll tell you how the Bible teaches we get saved. And I let them tell me. So what I'm doing there is asking them permission to give them the true gospel message. That's what they need to hear. And the most important thing to a Mormon is to hear this is a free gift. 
because they're under tremendous pressure to do works. And we're saying your works won't get you to heaven. Our God said, this is a free gift, folks. It's through Jesus Christ and him alone. We have a great message to give. And it's a comforting message to many. Folks, it took me seven years to understand the message. I had one man witness to me in a gymnasium. Seven years later, in a hotel room, I found there's finally understood his message. That's the night I got on my knees and professed Jesus Christ as my Lord and Savior. I got back in bed that night after being on my knees. And as I lay in bed, I still couldn't go to sleep. I had a strong desire to teach the book of Genesis, which I had not even read yet. So I started reading Genesis 1, pulled out the Bible in the hotel room, started reading Genesis chapter 1. As I finished the first chapter, I thought to myself, if I can't trust the words in this first chapter, there's no reason to read anything else in the Bible. Or maybe some of what I was taught in universities may not be true. So as I traveled around the country, I talked to scientists and I talked to professors and asked them questions about evolution. I soon found a pattern to their answers. They all had a lot of wonderful stories, but not one of them could directly answer my questions. So I thought to myself, here's these people that tower above me in, in knowledge. If I can't trust what they have to say, then why should I believe in evolution? Because when I was turning to the Bible, I was finding answers. Not only did I find answers, the Bible gives something that evolution can never offer you, and that's hope. For the first time in my life, I have hope. A number of years ago, my wife and I were on a six-week speaking tour throughout the southeastern states. Six weeks every day, one or more churches and schools. We stopped in one place in Jacksonville, Florida. And after we got there, I sat across from the pastor. We were staying with the pastor that night. I sat across from him. We began talking about the Bible. We talked about creation. Then we talked about some things we had done in our life, found out we had both been in the United States Marine Corps. And once you find that out, you have an instant bond. So I began to reminisce what we had done in the Corps. Found out we had both been stationed at Quantico, Virginia, a large Marine Corps training base. So we talked about that. Then we found out we had both been stationed at Yuma, Arizona, a small Marine Corps air and missile base. So we began to reminisce about that and kept talking and talking. And all of a sudden, he stopped talking. And he sat back in his chair. And he looked right at me. And he said this, I remember you. Do you remember me? 27 years ago, in a gymnasium, I gave you the gospel presentation. It was the same man. See, that man did what he was supposed to do, and what each and every one of us is commanded to do, and that is go out and give the truth. Don't try and change anybody's lives, because you can't do that. That's the Holy Spirit's job. Just give the truth. But you can't do that if you don't know and believe the truth. Thank you. God bless you.